um, this freedom to respond um, or or not to respond. I, right. I don't I don't see anywhere where it says that our individual uh, choices are pre-programmed. Um, okay. But uh, but 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 do we have uh, biblical support for man's inability to to seek God? If, if it's simply, we, in some ways, we have the Tower of Babel, which is almost human beings trying to become God and building their tower up to heaven and, and God getting quite annoyed by it. Aye. And so, you know, we all have these different languages and so on. Um, that's the story. I think it's Genesis um, 12. Um, but equally, God has... Um, created human beings with a set of responsibilities mm. and there are commandments and calls to seek God and, and simply the existence of those things suggest that there is room for human decision mm. um, to be made and that's part of the way that God has created us as humans mm -hmm. um, Amen. Well I, I, I would agree you see that um, in this sense this is a very negative agreement <laughs> I would agree that there is a responsibility on everybody to repent. There is a responsibility on everybody to seek God. But not everybody is capable of seeking God. And to support it now, I just go to John 10, 11, 14 to 16, 26 to 29. And this is, this is talking about how Christ saves us and how we are quickened. And it reads, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now, he doesn't lay down his life for the goats. He lays down in the scripturally clear. He laid down his life for his sheep, the believers. He didn't lay it down for unbelievers. We were unbelievers, right? But we were a special breed of unbelievers because we were in God's grace. And I came uh, into the knowledge of God very late in my years, right? And like, why? Don't ask me why. If I was God, I wouldn't save me. That I guarantee you. There's no way I'd save me. You now know? tell me, if, if, if God that seeks man, mm. why then do we as Christians have to evangelize? Why? Brother Simon, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's God that seeks man. Well, if, if God is um, interested in, in revealing who he is to people and... and bringing salvation to people. Uh, salvation, I think in scriptural terms, does not simply mean that you go to heaven when you die. Mm. It's, it's a full-blown um, present encounter with God that engages every dimension of our, of our human life. Mm. And evangelism, I think, is simply announcing um, to the world that God is in the business of bringing wholeness, and restoration and true humanity and salvation um, to all people and um, I mean I, I mean I, I do believe that there is is a human um, involvement here I mean if I offer a gift to my children for instance um, if I give my oldest boy some pocket money um, and he puts out his hand to take it, 
Right. There's a sense in which he's involved. Now, what he can't do is say, well, I'm involved, you know, uh, half of this um, right. this gift is, is down to my ability to receive it. Right. Um, it, it just in, involves him in the process and a, right. and a choice that he makes. His involvement doesn't mean that he's not a grateful recipient mm-hmm. of grace. And I think that's one of the ways that I would understand evangelism. Mm-hmm. It's simply in bringing God's gift and offering it right. to people. Yeah. But really uh, that question, you know. Yeah. I think evangelism is very, very important. I think in this day and age, evangelism has gone sour. Because evangelism now consists of filling the church with people, right? It's a very easy believism that they preach these days. And We evangelize. We evangelize by bringing the gospel message. Now, the gospel message is described as a two-edged sword, right? And it has two purposes. One to say it. One to quicken. Because it's true the word. The gospel has the power of salvation. It's not the eloquence of the man. It's not any of this. It's the very words he speaks. He can speak very hesitantly. He can stutter it out. And it doesn't take away from the power. That is God's method of alerting his own to his presence. It has two purposes. To save and to convict. And that's why it's a two-edged sword. On one hand, it has the aroma of life. And on the other hand, it has the stench of death. Yeah, but what we're saying here is that if it is God that mm. seeks man, mm. why then should men go about asking people to come to God? Because that's how God has arranged it to happen. Like, um, who did, uh, I'm, I'm not living the, the verses here, but it's talking about uh, the preacher being sent, right? And how can they hear the message if the messenger isn't sent? to bring the message. That is God's way of opening people's hearts. We have an absolute onus to witness to God. We have an absolute onus on us to bring the gospel message near and far. It's not up to us to decide who the sheep are. You know? wow. Because God has saved the scum of the earth. And he has saved yeah. You know, in the body of Christ, uh-huh. we talk about all these issues, looking at mm-hmm. them from different sides. People take different views on different uh, doctrinal issues. So now tell me, to what extent should we Christians agree? That is a good, that is a very good question. And it's a, it's a very controversial question. <laughs> Uh, and I feel I'm walking on eggshells in answering <laughs> that, you know? but I would say that there can be I, I would make it clear first of all that doctrine and I, I, I said to my, brother, this to my brother earlier on doctrine saves nobody we have only one saviour and that's the Lord Jesus Christ now it's not doctrine saves but what does save is the gospel message, you see. So, if we agree on the the principles of Christianity, that is, that God is God Almighty, that he is sovereign, that the Lord Jesus Christ is his Son, that he died on the cross for sin, and that the only name under heaven by whom we can be saved is through the Lord Jesus himself, well then, we can agree on that point, right? But we then may very well disagree on... Uh, you see, when I, when I talk about God's sovereignty, I'm saying God is in total sovereignty of everything. Right? There, there is nothing outside of God's control. Absolutely nothing. 
And if you go back to even um, uh, Joseph, when their brothers were going to get rid of him, right? It was a simple act on their part. They were going to kill him at first. They sell him as a slave to Egypt. He rises up and he becomes next to the Pharaoh himself in power. The famine comes again and they arrive, the brothers arrive, like, you know. He pretends not to recognize them. They're scared silly like that, he will. And then he admits that he has recognized them, like, you know, and he says something very significant. What you've done to me, you meant for ill. But God meant it for blood, you see. Well, the Bible he, says all things work together for good. That's true. That, for they that love that's, God. That's true. Well, you know, yes. as we're talking about these issues now, mm-hmm. there are unbelievers watching. Oh, yes. yes. And then if I have to take your argument that it's God that seeks the people, mm. then the unbeliever will, might believe you and say, well, I might as well just go around, you know, drinking, hanging out with the prostitutes and just carry on my normal life uh-huh. because God will finally seek and find me. Mm. But Isn't I, that the danger? Um, I don't really see it as a danger, you see, because um, they're hearing the gospel message here tonight that, you know, we're sinners. Uh, we were sinners without hope. We needed salvation. As they out there, if not believers, are sinners without hope. And you need salvation. And it can only come through repentance and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, unless you do that, you might as well go ahead and drink and make merry. Amen. Because that's the, <laughs> the end of it for you. That's the last of your enjoyment. Let's hear from no. Simon. How, to what extent should we as Christians agree? Talk to me. Uh, well, Dan and I are both Baptists, and that kind of means that we can't agree on very much, I suppose, because <laughs> Baptists are traditionally known for disagreeing well and I think we're doing a good job of disagreeing well <laughs> but um, the it's difficult isn't it it's, it's a good question I think as far as I can see um, I, I've got uh, a very simple criteria and that is if you uh, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved Aye. and that's that's good enough for me um, and of course, again, as Dan says, there will be as many different opinions of, as there are many different faces. I don't think any two people would agree entirely on everything. Mm. But mm. Um, the difficulty is that in um, modern uh, Christian history, there are three infallible people. There's Jesus, mm. um, there's the Apostle Paul, and there's me. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, not me. Yeah personally, but me as an individual, it's a day of individualism Mm. where we tend to presume that ours is the right one because Mm. I can always find somebody on my left and always find somebody on my right, so I'm the one with a balanced view who's who's got a a good whole perspective. Mm. And part of being in the body of Christ and encountering Christ and celebrating communion is that we encounter Christ in Mm -hmm. one another in such a way as to encourage us when we need to be encouraged, to challenge Mm us. Um, when we need to be challenged, and, and that's how we, we grow. And I think, uh-huh. uh, again, Dan mentioned earlier that iron sharpens iron. If we can't uh-huh. have a decent mm-hmm. disagreement, then we mm-hmm. can't have much together. So, so well, yeah, what I, this? I think we're faced with something that's sort of basic here. I, I would ask for an explanation of what it means when it says you are spiritually dead. Like, uh, there, there, there isn't a degree of death. Like, you're either dead or alive. You can be barely alive on your last gasp, but you're nonetheless alive, you know. So, it's the same with death. If you're dead, you're dead. Now, I would like an explanation of how this corpse can, of its own accord, have the new birth. Like Nicodemus was right, like, you know, he said, well, I, I, I can't get back into my mother's womb. <laughs> he wasn't expected to, like, you know, and the Christ himself explained it to him. You must be born from a bull of spirit and blood. Now, I would ask anybody, what influence did you or yourself, Yemi, have over our physical 
conception and birth. We had absolutely no influence whatsoever. How can we believe that we have an influence over our new birth, which is a spiritual birth, clearly stated in Scripture, born from above, or spirit and blood? You know, I, I don't have to argue my way around that. Yeah. I have to say, well, if it tells me I'm dead, brother, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. So, but what does this tell us about the character of God himself? Well, from my point of view, God is a God that is sovereign in all things. Sovereign in creation, sovereign in salvation. He's a God that doesn't react to man. He's a God that causes man to act. And I think if we could get a proper concept of the almightiness and the sovereignty of God, and our total uh, how would I put it? Our, our, our corruption in, in, in placed against his righteousness, you know? We, we have to get down and bow the knee before this God who in his grace and mercy decided to save some. He needn't have saved anybody. Now people often say to me, Dan, what you're saying is not just. And I'd agree with you. It's not just. The last prayer you want to make to God is that he'll teach, uh, treat you justly. If he treats you justly, you're going straight to hell. I'm not talking about justice. I'm talking about the undeserved grace and kindness Amen. of God. Amen. Yeah. Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Deary me. Um, I suppose it's a fairly... Um, simple question. When you're looking at the character of God, I do believe in the sovereignty of God, of course, right. but also this is a God who makes himself vulnerable. This is a God who feels pain because of what human mm. beings do. Mm -hmm. It's not a distant dictator. It's not somebody who's wound the world up and left it to tick. Mm -hmm. um, this is a God who's become flesh and blood, who gets his hands right. dirty with human beings. Um, and it, it strikes me as um, I struggle to relate this picture of God with a God who creates people um, with apparently no other purpose than sending them to hell because that's predestined before the, the dawn of time and so on. And, and that's something that I, that I do struggle yeah. with. And I, yeah. You have an answer for that yeah, already. I, I, I'll have to come in on that. Because, um, no... <laughs> Uh, there are those predestined to salvation, right? But, you see, God actually shepherds his own to heaven, right? He, he shepherds them like the good shepherd. He shepherds us to heaven. And make sure we get there and that nothing can stop that happening. He doesn't shepherd the rest of humanity, to hell. No. They find their own merry way to hell, of their own accord. The only reason he doesn't shuffle them in that sense is he doesn't have to. You know, if he doesn't interfere with man, intervene in man, man will never turn to God, because man has a heart of stone. Scripture says it so clearly, you know. He has a heart of stone. He's corrupt. He has free will within the limitation of his corruption. But that's, that's as far as it goes. It doesn't mean that he is, each individual is totally as bad as he could be. And it doesn't mean that the individual can't do good of some kind. Yeah, he can. So, you, you, you were still going through some points earlier about the, you know, the, the, the character of God. Oh, uh, Yes, I suppose. I mean, I, I do um, still struggle with the idea um, 
that, on the one hand, human beings do not have uh, the freedom to choose God, but they do have the freedom to choose hell. I think that that's something that I, I struggle to get my... Uh, to get my head around. Yeah, I think that's that's the point I picked up from uh, what yeah. Brother Dan was saying because if it's God that seeks His people, mm. then you know, isn't it the isn't it the fact now that He's rejected some people and they're destined for hell? But let me put it in another way: if if it's God that seeks for His people, then once we become born again, can we lose our salvation then? No, <laughs> no, no. You, you, you just heard me saying. I'll, I'll read it again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Another sheep I have which are not of this fault, that's you and I. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. But Nobody. Could sheep in that sense not mean the ones that are already in the kingdom? You know, sometimes even, even though you have sheep that, are, you know, that know the shepherd, the flow with the shepherd, there's still yeah. some rascally sheep that... Go astray. That's right, and that's where the gospel message comes in. To stop them in their tracks and make them alert. They're, they're, they own, the only ones that hear. So they can't lose their salvation? No, they can't. No, nobody can lose salvation. Like, I, I write I this to you, it's in, I think it's in uh, Second John, it says, This I write to you so that you may know you have eternal life. Not that you may be or you might earn it. You have it. You cannot lose it. I mean, I, I take a again. I take a different view. I think the um, invitation of Scripture is constantly to view Christianity. Originally, wasn't called Christianity. Mm. Christians were called atheists before they were called Christians uh, because uh. they didn't worship the Roman gods and so on. Uh -huh. um, the first thing that Christians were called were followers of the Way. Mm. And throughout Scripture, there's this idea of God being on the move and the people of God being on the move with Him. So those who choose to um, be followers of God are literally out there followers. There's an everydayness about Christianity um, in Scripture and throughout Christian history. Um, and many of the commands of the New Testament right. come in what in Greek it's called the present continuous tense. Mm. Go on seeking, um, and you will find. Go on knocking, mm -hmm. and we get to the big one, John 3:16. Right. Um, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that right. whoever goes on believing in me will not perish but have eternal life uh -huh. and I think the whole idea of assurance of salvation comes when you are walking with God and right. so for instance I have the if I'm trying to find my way back into central London this evening mm -hmm. as long as I'm going in the right direction I will have assurance because mm -hmm. I will pass all the, r the right landmarks mm -hmm. but if I deviate from route I lose the assurance uh -huh. and so in, in scripture I think part of the um, mm -hmm. the way that I read rather differently from Dan is that many of the commands come to a community of people the whole point of scripture is whether God can keep his promise. The righteousness mm. of God in Romans is whether God can be trusted to keep the promises that he made to Abraham mm -hmm. to bless him with huge offspring. And in the end, it all boils down to Jesus himself. All of God's eggs are in this one basket. And as we see the New Testament unfold, it unfolds in the shape of an hourglass. And the people mm -hmm. of God, the descendants of Abraham, are no longer those who are descended by flesh and blood, but who share Abraham's faith. Aye. Um, but it's constantly, it's that faith in God which needs to be renewed on a, on a daily basis. And I think, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can look at various passage that, passages in Scripture, and even in Calvin, mm -hmm. um, that's, that suggest you can lose your salvation. If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Mm -hmm. in Hebrews, if, if uh, mm -hmm. I need to check the reference, but it, it talks about it being impossible for those who wanted the boy to be restored. Um, the New Testament, mm -hmm. to my mind, 
suggests that it, it's not a done deal. It's not when you become a Christian, that's it, you can <laughs> sit back and God will forgive me because uh, I ticked the boxes and prayed mm. the, the, the prayers that I had to pray. Um, there's a, the command is every day, it's choose you this day, whom you will mm-hmm. serve Jesus, you know, as long as it is called mm-hmm. today, we mm-hmm. must do the work of mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. but Hebrews, God set aside a certain day calling it today when we celebrate Sabbath oh, yeah. and we're reoriented mm-hmm. within the purposes of God. Mm-hmm. Wow. Brother Dan. Yeah. yeah. So why can I can I just cl- come in there for yes. a second, like, you know? You see, what would bother me about your reading of scripture there is I depend for my assurance of salvation on the Lord. You depend, in a sense, that's what I read, like, you know, on your assurance of salvation on yourself, right? Now, when I look at myself and the, the, the fact that, um, you know, that there's still the carnal man, that old nature is still there, like, you know, that you're struggling against on a daily and an early and maybe a minute basis, like, you know. And I know if my salvation depends on me, <laughs> then I'm without hope. So why do you... Okay. My, 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 my whole assurance of salvation lies with the Lord Jesus Christ, that I am in his hands and that no one can snatch me out. So how do you know you're saved? How do I know I'm saved? Or what do you need? What do you have to do to be saved? You have to believe. You know so how? You mean you just believe and that's it? You don't say anything? Like you, no, know, no. you go to some churches. They have what yeah. they call the altar call yeah. and the yeah. sinner's prayer. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have to say the sinner's prayer, or what do you do to be saved? Yeah. <laughs> you see, when God enlightens you, when God quickens you, at that moment in time. You're not even aware of the fact that you've been born again. And at that moment in time, you seek God, right? Now, what my brother here was talking about, we have to go back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were made perfect, absolutely perfect. And for them to be made perfect, for them to be perfect, of necessity, they had to have total free will. They had to have the ability to obey or disobey, or they wouldn't have been perfect, you see. They fell, and they blew that. Now, in the opening verses of uh, Genesis, there's emphasis on the fact that when he made Adam, he made him in his image. In the image of God, he made him, right? Then you go up a couple of chapters, and it says, and this is the generation of Adam. And again it says, Adam was made in God's image. And then it says, and he begot this, that, and the other in his own image. Being the federal head of humanity, everyone born after Adam was born corrupt, was born fallen, and was born in sin and deserving sin. What about Deserving people? condemnation. What about people who go forward at a crusade mm-hmm. to give their lives to Christ? They, they, they call forward, they go there, they say a sinner's prayer. Uh, Are they born again? Um, I have grave doubts about the vast majority of these people who go forward on an emotional high at these great crusades. Uh, I would love to see statistics shown that's where you read of 300 said the sinner's prayer and became saved. I'd like to see how many of these 300 actually attend church, how many are genuine believers that they have gone on to serve the Lord to the best of their ability and have gone on trying to live as righteously as they can. And I'd hazard a guess that there would be very few. So it's, only, so it's only the individual that knows he or she is born again, not, not as a result of uh, going forward, praying the sin of prayer and being in yeah. church. I, I think that's easy to believe. You see, I think they're told, come forward, and you accept the Lord, and they've been, you know, and yeah, they, they, they don't power to accept the Lord. 
And it's thinking, like, hell hasn't been preached to them. Damnation hasn't been preached to them. The consequences of sin hasn't been preached to them. You know, they're, they're usually told, look, God loves you as you are. Come, come. You know, like this. I doubt it. Was hell preached to you and damnation and 